Romans chapter 15, verse number 8 through 13. Anybody got a word of testimony maybe tonight that you'd like to share? Say a word. Good word for the Lord. Anyone? All right, I'll pick Daniel out. There you go. Uh, some people probably heard the last Sunday morning Pastor Dice preached his first sermon since the heart transplant. Yes. The 40th anniversary of service, so it was really, really big. Yes. Hey, Amen. He, he's a walking miracle. There is no doubt about it. Um, they, they found out that some of the meds that he had, Brother Daniel said, some of the meds that he was taking or not taking, one of the two, not taking. So anyway, he, his blood was getting too thick and it was causing cause a stroke or maybe a couple or something. And so he had heart transplant. My soul in the daylight. And uh, here he is. He's come to Pittsfield to preach. Um, for their 40th anniversary, the 40th, uh, uh, what do they call it? Anniversary of the birth of the church. So, um, anyway, what what a... Uh, unbelievable. I mean, after he had the, uh, the heart transplant, he couldn't function. He was locked up, basically, unable to function, go, I mean, and stuff. So, anyway, amen. Continue to pray for him. I will tell you this, wherever he's at, he's going to testify about the Lord Jesus, wherever he's at. You can count on that. Yeah. Count on it. Yes. The word for, um, he's been softening the hearts of my coworkers to the gospel. Yes. So none have heeded to the call. They have been more listening, so thank the Lord for that. Yes. For his gospel. Yes. So it's simple, and you don't need a theology manual to know the gospel. It's true. It's true. I've seen John Thomas in the grocery store the other day. Okay. He was on a cart and had big oxygen tank. Yep. Said he couldn't leave the house unless he had somebody to accompany. Right. He couldn't drive. Yes. We, yes. We send, we send him YouTube or remind him of the YouTube uh, messages every week and he listens to them so thank the Lord for that ability um, last week um, just from Sunday morning brother Bagwell to Sunday night the with the services I think we had close to 300 views on on all of those and so thank the Lord for it uh, we've got a couple of new subscribers and so Thank the Lord for that um, outreach. Um, so, thank the Lord. Romans chapter 15, verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written... For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with the, his people. And again, praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. My title tonight is Why Jesus Came. Paul under divine guidance, closes out this wonderful word from God, the book of Romans. Wonderful book, wonderful word of God, isn't it? Just wonderful. And he closes it by telling us why 
Jesus came. So I want us to think about four thoughts tonight about why Jesus came, taken right out of our text tonight. First, Jesus came to show God's truthfulness. In verse number 8, we read here, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. The church at Rome is full of Jews and Gentiles, but here in verse 8, Paul is addressing the Jews, converted Jews, Christians who come from Jewish life. And we're told here that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. The minister, he is a diakonos. He is a word from which we get the word deacon. He is a servant ministering to the circumcision, a word that describes the Jews, right? Term for the Jews. It was the Old Testament covenant sign given to the Israel, the Jew. Uh, and why was it given? To remind them that they were in covenant with God. And so he's addressing them. And uh, Jesus came to the Jews first to reveal that he was the long-awaited Messiah, the one who had been promised throughout the Old Testament, has now come, and he's here. And not only that, he came not only to reveal, but to confirm, to confirm to them that his coming confirms the promises that have been made to the fathers. The promises that have been made to Israel of old. The promises were made by God to them. Why did Jesus come? To show that he's the Messiah. To show that the promises that have been made to the Jews throughout the generations and thousands and thousands of years are absolutely true. They're accurate. They are absolutely precise. There is no error with them. So Jesus came to show God's truthfulness. Now the Jews had already heard about these promises. But now they've had opportunity to see hundreds of them. Hundreds of promises fulfilled in Christ's first coming. Hundreds of promises fulfilled. They've seen it. Jesus was virgin born. As is promised in Isaiah. He, he, he was crucified. As depicted in Isaiah 53. And Psalm 22. He was rejected of the brethren. And all of the promises that were given throughout the Old Testament there, they are fulfilled and they've seen that they were fulfilled. Why did Jesus come? He's confirming. He's affirming that he is the promise fulfiller of Old Testament. So, uh, it confirms, he confirms that God's word is true. He confirms that God's promises are trustworthy, that they're reliable. That word confirm is found over in 1 Peter or 2 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 20 or excuse me 19 1 Peter 1 19 that is not it 2 Peter did I say 1 Peter the second time or the first time what did I say second you don't know either. I've got you so confused. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19. Here, here, here it is. It's found right here. If the preacher can find it. It says, uh, we have also, same word here. 
That's confirmed. We have also a more sure, sure word of prophecy. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The prophecy predictions Old Testament, all the Old Testament predictions of Holy Scripture. It says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What? We have the Spirit-led, Spirit-given, Holy Spirit-directed words and promises in the Old Testament. And the Bible said they're sure. That same word that's found here, confirmed. They're absolutely certain. You can count on it. Jesus' first coming had to do with confirming that God's promises and God's word is absolutely accurate. No error. So what's that mean? It means that the word of God can be trusted. It means Jesus can be trusted tonight. Right? A couple of songs here. Listen to them. I'm not going to sing a brother. <sighs> Clear me. He wanted me to sing. He said, you're up there playing. Why don't you sing something? I'm not going to sing, but I am going to quote a couple of passages, uh, songs. L listen to it. Song, uh, my faith is found a resting place. Listen to My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds shall plead for me. No other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word. The written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. How firm a foundation. Listen uh, to verse 1 there. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. We have got a foundation. It's strong as rock. It's excellent an excellent word. Why? Because it's God's word. We talked about it this morning. God breathed. It is the very words of God. So why did Jesus come? He came to confirm. He came to make firm. And create confidence about God's promises. Particularly referenced in that verse to the Jews. But to us as well. I wonder, have you been confirmed? And I'm not talking about going through a religious ceremony. Have you been confirmed in your heart that Jesus is the only, that you are a sinner, that Jesus is the only Savior, and that He has forgiven your sins, and you are relying totally on His promise to you that He said that He would? Paul was confident in Christ. He said, Philippians 1, 6, being confident. That, that's a great statement. Being confident. No self-confidence. Oh, it's not me. It's not Paul said, it's not me. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He, was, he, he knew. He was confirmed in his heart that Jesus is the Savior and that He was in the family of God. Accepted in the Beloved. So Jesus came to show God's truthfulness. Why did Jesus come? Thank you. Number two, Jesus came to give God's mercy. Look at verse number eight and nine again. Verse eight, we just read there, it said... That Jesus came to minister to the Jew, confirm the promises made to the fathers. And verse 9, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Why did Jesus come? To give God's mercy. That's why he came. Verse 8. 
He talks to the Jews. He focuses on the Jews. Verse 9, he focuses on the Gentiles. Verse 8, he's Messiah for the Jews. Verse 9, he's mercy for the Gentiles. These next verses then, some two, four, six, six times in three verses, we read Gentile. Gentile, 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 the Gentiles. It's talking about the Gentiles and focusing in on the Gentiles. Gentiles are outcasts. They're well described in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Listen to it tonight. It says, uh, verse 11, start with verse 11. Where, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Separated. I mean, you weren't a part of it. Separated from the commonwealth of Israel. And then it goes on to say, and strangers from the covenants of promise. You weren't in on this covenant. You weren't in on these promises that were given. Having no hope. And without God. In the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. <laughs> you can get in the family. You can get your sins cleansed. You can get in the covenant. You can get in on the promises. Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, Simon Peter, he said, uh, was told, go preach to the Cornelius in the Gentile house. And he said, nothing, go on. I'm not going over that dirty crowd, right? I'm not having anything to do with them. I'm a Jew. And he learned real quick that God was about the business of going to Gentiles, non-Jews, and saving them. And God got in them and changed them. And he was saving Gentiles. And then, of course, Ephesians 2 talks about that's the church. Oh, yeah, Jews and Gentiles, and we're all one in Christ, in the family of God. So, uh, a people who were not a people are now a people. How? By mercy. Only by mercy are we God's people. Not by merit, it's by mercy. Mercy is guilt being removed. Mercy is sins being forgiven. Mercy is your past being erased. Mercy is filthiness being cleansed. Mercy is deliverance from the wrath of God forever. Mercy. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. He saved us according to mercy. I told Diana that she ought to get a, a monogrammed sweater and it ought to have an M on it. You know how you girls do sometimes? Put an M on it right over your heart. An M. And then that way when everybody uh, sees her, they'll ask the question. What, what's your name? Oh, Diana Lynn Sanders, formerly Campbell. Oh, what, what do you got an M on for? Oh, that's for mercy. <laughs> Good witnessing opportunity, right? <laughs> Wearing around an M all the time. Right over your heart. You tell, oh, that's right over my heart. <laughs> it's, it's the gospel. I know they think you're nuts, but it's all right. Nuts for Jesus, right? <laughs> mercy. Uh, I'm glad that God's not just a God of exact justice who never ever shows mercy. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Okay, you've sinned. All right, punishment, sin, punishment. 
I'm glad God, he is a God of precise justice, but I'm glad to announce tonight that he's a God of great mercy. He is a God of great mercy, and it's only because he has mercy on us as sinners that we can be saved. And it's only because justice, his justice, has been fully satisfied that now he can give mercy. He couldn't do it before. Not and be true to himself. Every sin had to be punished. Every one of your sins had to be punished. Paid for. And that's what Jesus did at the cross. And because he paid for all of it, now you can be mercied. Now you can be forgiven. Undeservingly forgiven. You don't deserve it. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 and 6. But God's worked it so that he can extend mercy to me. Give me what I don't deserve. And not give me what I do deserve. Oh, God's mercy. Can I give you a couple passages on mercy? Describing it. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's abundant mercy, we're told. God has abundant mercy for us. Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9. I love these verses. The Lord's gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all of His works. I love this one. Mark, My, Micah chapter 7, verse number 18. Can somebody else come up here and talk for me tonight? Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is God, a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of His heritage? He retaineth not His anger forever, because He... I love this. Listen. He delighteth in mercy. You say, oh, I know how God is. He's tight-fisted on His mercy. He's not giving forgiveness. You're kidding me. He's holding it back. He's trying to make sure you don't ever get it. Try to claw his fingers open if you'd like, but you can't get it. He's, he's grudgingly holding on, forbidding it. He not... No. He said, here it is. Amen. Come and get it. <laughs> he delights in mercy. He said, I'd sure like to see the prodigal son want to get out of the hog pen and head back to the house so I could give him a big kiss like a heavenly father. Mercy. He delights in it. Would, wouldn't make him, it, nothing make him feel any better than thrill him anymore. Than to see a sinner come and say, I don't deserve any of it. Just go ahead and slap me around or do whatever you need to do. But I, I'm just coming. I've got to have you. And he said, yep. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a new robe on you. And we're going to have a celebration. Jesus came to give us mercy. It's called great mercy, abundant mercy. Uh, should I look some other verses up? I like this one. Psalm 86 and 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Plenteous in mercy. I don't know whether he's got enough. You know, Ephesians says he's rich in mercy. There's plenty. You, you say, but you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know how big God's plenteous, rich mercy is. It's plenty, plenteous. There's plenty to go around. I thought after I got saved that it'd all be extinguished or exhausted. But that's not the case. You know what? You can come. And, and others can come. And you can come. Everybody can come. 
and mercies available. There's plenty for us. Uh, I think about the Apostle Paul in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 13. Paul giving his testimony and he says this, uh, who was before a blasphemer, Paul's a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, he said. Paul, the hater of Christianity, putting his stamp of approval on murdering them, on executing them. He was a murderer. He confessed it there in that chapter. He's a murderer. What happened? He received mercy from God. That's how big it is. You probably haven't ever murdered anybody. Tonight. If God could save Paul. And Paul said, I'm, I'm an example of how great this mercy is. He can forgive you. He can mercy you. Jesus came to give us mercy. Jesus came to show us God's tr uh, truthfulness. Thirdly, Jesus came to create joyful, thankful worshipers. Look at verse number 9. It says... Um, and that of our text now, Romans 15. It says, uh, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And then it goes on down through there. Verse 9 through 12. Over and over again, there's an emphasis on the fact that God saves us to glorify him, to worship him, to rejoice in him. It, listen to what it says. He says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Oh, he forgave me. I'm going to glorify God. I want to glorify God. Like he's deserving of. And then he goes on and he quotes numerous Old Testament passages. In verse 9, he quotes Psalm 18. Verse 10, quotes Deuteronomy 32. Verse 11, Psalm 117, in verse 12, he quotes Psalm, uh, uh, Isaiah 11. He's quoting from all of these various parts of the Old Testament. And you can preach on all, all kinds of subjects that are in there. But the overriding emphasis of all of that is that God saves us so we will glorify Him, praise Him, love Him, yeah. rejoice in Him. Look at it, verse 9. That the Gentiles might glorify God for this cause. I will confess. What's he talking about? Somebody verbally confessing him. I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. We talked about singing this morning. It's more important than you think. Yeah. And that we said, learned in the other text. Sing to him. Sing to him. He calls for it. You say, well, I can't sing very good. Well, then just move your lips. Just try to hum along. Right? Verse 10. And again, he saith, rejoice. Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. You weren't, weren't a people of God, but now you're with his people. Rejoice with them about our great God. And again, praise the Lord. Praise Him. All ye Gentiles. And laud Him. All ye people. You say, what's that word? We don't use that word anymore, do we? Laud. But you can find the word laud in the word applaud. A-P-P-L-A-U-D. Applaud. Laud. What are we doing? We're praising Him. Lord, you've done such wondrous things. You are so worthy. You are so great. Oh, you deserve hand claps that I can't even create. You, right? You, applaud. Applaud. 
Oh, we applauded. That was a great song. That was a great song that y'all sang, the choir sang. No, no, what about applauding him? You say, well, I don't like that clapping hands. Well, don't clap your hands. Just applaud in your heart. Applaud by confessing him. Praise by singing to him. Right? We should, that should be the normal, natural response for what he's done for us. When we reflect on his mercy, rejoice, be glad, praise, laud, applaud, enthusiastically give praise to him for what he's done. Joseph Addison, the old 1600s, 17th century from England said, when all thy mercies Oh, my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view, that is, of his mercies. I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. It would be good if we could get captured by his mercy to the point that it just gets all over us, you know, where we, where we get happy about it. We start realizing what it is. And we start saying, what a God. What a Savior. What a salvation. What a Holy Spirit power. What a great Heavenly Father. <laughs> and then verse number 12, look at it. It says, and again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. We're going to trust his faithful working in me and for me. Trusting. So, why did Jesus come? To create joyful, thankful worshipers. Yeah. Amen. He, that's why I came. Number four. Jesus came to fill up empty people. Amen. In verse number 13, this is Paul's prayer for those Jews and Gentiles Jew, Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. And he says that the God of hope, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. <laughs> hmm. Why did Jesus come? To fill people that did, were joyless and those who were without peace. And then he says that you may abound in hope. And it comes by, it says, in believing and through the power of the Holy Ghost. So, what do we have here? We're deficient. We're deficient in joy and peace and hope. That's the natural condition of humanity. Deficient of joy, peace, and hope. But God can fill us. And not only say He fill, fills us, but that they might abound. That is overflow and abound with these things. Joy, peace, hope. We can overcome. We have to have him to overcome these, this joylessness, lack of peace, and jo hopelessness. We, we must have him. He must do it for us. It's... it's Holy Ghost power, His work in our lives, God's work in our lives. When I think about the joylessness, I immediately think of David. 
David, King David, lost his joy, had none, for a year. Why? Because of sin in his life. You say, I just can't get any kind of kick for God anymore. I can't get any thrill for God anymore. I'd check about sin in your life. Psalm 51, David then prays, confesses up, owns up to it all, asks for God's great compassion and mercy. And he says, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When's it come? When he dealt with sin. Sin had shut the joy off. The Spirit of God was grieved. Quenched. He said, nope. Until you do something about that, you're going to be a joyless soul. David. Oh, he could try to somehow act like everything was all right, but it wasn't. It's just an act. It wasn't real. But it can be real. The joy of God. God can change us. Our joylessness. And then peace. One writer said, the best tranquilizer is a clear conscience. It's true. You, people are so a nervous wreck because of sin in their lives. They don't have a clear conscience. They're conscious, constantly aggravating, not constantly accused. Oh yeah, you, you filthy thing. You're just trash. You're just, you know, all this constant accusation that's coming. We'll get rid of it. You can get rid of it. The blood of Jesus Christ, Hebrews said, can cleanse our conscience. You can get a cleared conscience. The one thing about the night I got saved was, all of a sudden, all this load of guilt and shame that was on me was lifted. It went off. It's the same way with the child of God. Throughout, throughout life, there have been times when there was something that's just, I'm disobedient to God in some area, some fashion. And it's just joy dries up. But if I come honestly confessing, He gives me a fresh joy and peace in my heart. Yeah. Starting down wrong paths, all of a sudden you start getting nervous. And it might not initially be outwardly displayed, but it is inwardly. And you know it. And as God said, don't do it. It's not right. You know it's not right. I'm going to have to whoop you if you don't quit. I don't know. I don't know whether. He, he, he probably used Elizabeth in English. Instead of modern terminology, whoop. Whoop. He'll whoop us. Doesn't he? Whom the Father loves, He chastens. And then hope. Think about that. God's got hope for us, we're told. Jesus came to fill up empty people with joy and peace and hope. Hope. I've got hope. We can have hope. If you don't watch out, the devil will get you under his thumb and you'll get, well, there's no hope. There's no use. Ah, forget that. Look at this world the way it is. You know, you can't. And look at me. I can't ever be what God wants me to be, so I'm just quitting. It's just, forget it. And yet the Lord can birth hope in you. He didn't say, well, whenever you get everything, I've got a list about 20 things, and if you, when you want you get all those 20 right, 
you're going to have some hope then. That's not it either. Because you never get there. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm, I'm trusting Him. My approach tonight to my Heavenly Father is based solely on what Jesus did at the cross for me. And not only that, but what He gave me. What did He give me? His perfect, imputed righteousness. It's good for you to understand that. That means I am fully accepted in the blood, perfectly accepted in the beloved. So you know what that means? No matter what, I have hope. <laughs> so I just open my, crack my Bible to Romans 8, 28, and I start reading it. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. And I go, doesn't look like this is going anywhere. Doesn't, like, doesn't look like this is going to end up well. This looks like this. I'm not sure there's any what tomorrow's going to bring. I, I know a lot of people that are determining their, all of their hope. They're putting it all in one basket. Know where they're putting it? Tuesday, the election. Not me. I, I can read some things that will be what, however the, all the results are and all those kind of things. I understand. I mean, you know. And I know I've got some hopes and wishes. And well, wishes, is that a good term? Desires. But you know what? My Lord already knows the results. <laughs> and you know what? All things are working for good somehow, some way. To them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Right? So you know what? On Wednesday, we're going to get up and walk with God. And going to find out he gives joy, peace, and hope to those who are trusting. Living for him. Loving him. All right. What were the four points? Anybody take notes? Yeah. Gary, tell them. Shows truthfulness. Shows mercy. To create joyful, thankful worshipers. To fill up empty people. There you have it. That's why Jesus came. Let's stay. What about your heart tonight? Joyless, lacking peace, hopeless, we're just told that Jesus Christ came to give us just the opposite.
joy, peace, and hope. Confidence. Confident expectation. Deficient, we're lacking those things. But He wants to fill us with those things to the point that they're abounding, we're told. Heavenly Father, thank you for mercies tonight. Thank you for your word. Lord, I'm awful glad that uh, I got to see these truths here uh, for my heart. And I pray that you'll just help our hearts do something special uh, to, to create in us spirit-filled living, Savior worship. Gratitude for mercy. Confidence. You said you came to give truth. Your truth and your word. We thank you for it. We ask your blessing to go with your people. If someone's outside the family unsaved, I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to trouble them. Draw them to yourself. Save them. Change them. Help them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.